everybody is looking for the deal that they can retire off of, so to speak. But I've learned long ago that those deals almost never come along. One of those was I got a call from my upholstery guy who did upholstery for a guy who had some Packards and Duesenbergs. And he said, this guy has a great collection of exotics as well. And he wants to sell quite a number of them. Do you have kind of an idea of the list? And he gave me a general idea. And in my head, I'm adding this up going, man, this is, this could be substantial. This is not a retirement deal, but this is a make my year deal. In order to even get into the collection, I had to go up with my buddy, the upholsterer, because he was well known to this guy. He was a very private collector. And so we set up a time. I picked him up, drove up to the collection. So I thought it was just the two of us. But there was a couple other guys that showed up. And I had been told, I guess there was a guy who was an expert in Corvettes, and this guy had a substantial Corvette collection. And I didn't want to step on any toes, so I just kind of like walked around with them. I didn't document the Corvettes. I didn't try to get involved in that or whatever. I'm not there to be a, a snake. But while we're in this Corvette building, one of the other guys was FaceTiming with who knows who, but he's FaceTiming the entire collection. And I'm like, what the heck is this guy doing? Like I was under strict orders to like maybe or maybe not take pictures, but definitely not share them. And like all of this is confidential but didn't say anything, not my business. Go over to the exotic building. Thankfully, those other two guys left because they didn't give a rip about those cars. So I got some time to sit down with the owner and he was very hospitable. He had a full bar there and kitchen and you know we had lunch in there and just sat down and chatted. And I asked him, I said, okay, what's, what's your goal here? You know, How can I serve you? Do you want cash offers on these cars? Do you want me to just number all of them and buy them? And he said, no, 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 I don't, I don't need cash offers. I don't, I don't want you to have to put up your money. Just bring me reasonable offers. I said, okay, well, you know, here's how much I charge on commission. So I'll be happy to do that. And I said, well, do you have ideas of a number that you want on these cars? Because usually big collectors are very in tune to the market and they have very definitive expectations. And no, 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 I trust, I trust you to value them. Bring me reasonable offers. So almost every car was pristine, low mileage, still on MSO, gorgeous, a collection of four GTs, some Ferraris, et cetera, et cetera. One of the cars there was a Lamborghini Murcielago stick shift. And I took a quick look at it and immediately decided I had zero interest in the car. I mean, out of every car in the collection, I'm like, this is the one I'm not going to touch. He had bought it at a U.S. Marshals auction or FBI auction. It was this Ponzi scheme guy in Indiana and the FBI had seized all of his cars. So it was a previous repo. It was a color change from yellow to black. The gauge cluster had been changed. So it was TMU. It wasn't even a good color change from yellow to black because I could still see the yellow. I think it was a rebuilt title. I mean, it had literally every check that you could have on it that just said, call Ed Bolian, he would love this car. But I'm not Ed Bolian, so I'm like, nope, I'm not touching this car. I don't want anything to do with it. I'm gonna sell the really nice cars in here. Send him some offers on cars that I got via clients, and he's like, no, 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 that's way too low. I want this. I'm like, oh, okay, well, you said you didn't have numbers in mind for your car, but obviously you do, so why don't you save me some time and tell me what you need for them? Oh, well, you know, just bring me offers. And he's like, well, by the way, I got an offer for this one already at this number. I'm like, okay, well, you said you weren't shopping the cars to anyone else, but that would have been nice to know as well. A couple days later, he calls me, chewing me out. He's like, why am I getting calls on my Lamborghini you know, from California? I'm like, I haven't the faintest idea. I, I haven't offered that to anyone. Or you know, maybe I called two people, but they're end users. There's no broker shopping this car. There was a guy in there FaceTiming all of your Corvettes and the Lamborghini was in that building with the Corvette. So I'm like, other people know about your car, so don't call me, I'm the one exercising discretion here. And he finally admitted like, oh yeah, actually, well I did tell a few other people about it, so maybe that was it. I'm like, okay, thanks for calling and chewing me out for doing my job. Then he ended up selling like a dozen cars to Marshall Goldman because Goldman just wrote him a check for them. I was like, I thought that wasn't what you wanted, but okay, fine, sell them to dealers. Okay, thanks for 
being totally honest about the direction you want to go with all these cars. Ironically enough, the car that I said I wouldn't touch, I called Ed Bolian about. The salvage title, odometer, not for real, not so truthful odometer reading, color change, Ponzi scheme, repo, FBI, Mercy Lago, got Ed all excited. And he had a buyer for one, ironically, a guy local here in Ohio. So we made a deal and I called up the owner of the car and said, hey, I've got an offer for you on this Mercy Lago. Would you take it? And he had given me an indication of where he wanted to be. And so I brought him an offer at that number. Oh, no, no, I want more than that. So commenced negotiations again. And the car had some not so great wheels on it. So he had told me he had the factory wheels, but he did not explicitly say, I am including them. But the way it was stated, it was implied. So when I asked him to put the factory wheels on the truck, he, oh, those, those are separate. I want $10,000 for those. And I'm like, I'm sorry, what? You said you had them. Oh yeah, I said I had them. That didn't mean they were included. Okay, well, we'll call that an error of omission, but I finally convinced him to include just the factory wheels and he could keep the aftermarket wheels because we didn't want those and they needed new tires, but whatever, at least we got the factory wheels. Now he had said, again, he was trying to be very amicable. He said, you know, I have a, my own flatbed. I have a driver. I'll just send it down to your shop and drop it off. I said, well, I'm not around this morning. Like, I can't wire you money until this afternoon. I'm out and about. No problem. No problem. No big deal. We'll handle it later. So I said, well, you know, the guy's just in Youngstown. If he's coming here anyway, it's the same distance for your flatbed. Can you just drop it off at his house? Yep, yep. I'll have the trucker do that. So I'm doing whatever I'm doing that morning, meetings, and I get these frantic calls from everybody. And Chris, the buyer, is like, hey, man, he won't release the Mercy Lago because you haven't paid for it. I'm like, okay, that wasn't our understanding, but sure, I'll give him a call. So I call up the seller, and I was like, hey, what's, what's the deal? And he starts screaming at me on the phone that I gave him the runaround, and his trucker's there, and he wasted all this time, and blah, 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 swearing at me, dropping the F-bomb. Like, this guy just... Jekyll and Hyde on me. I'm like, what the heck? I'm like, listen, you, you were just going to drop it off at my shop. Like, I have no problem paying you. I just was busy this morning. I told you I was going to wire it this afternoon and you chose to send a flatbed to the guy's house on that understanding. So I, I don't see what the big problem is here. My temper may have been raised a little bit too, because I was in my mind, defending my honor and my integrity. I'm like, this is our agreement and you're just like making stuff up and putting words in my mouth and flying off the handle. We got it worked out. He was basically like, you have until 4 p.m. for the wire to hit my account or I'm turning the truck around. I guess the flatbed waited there and I'd scrambled and found my way to a computer and got him the wire and everything ended up being okay. But I was glad that that was the only deal I was going to do with him. He and I both made it abundantly clear to each other that that was going to be the only deal. So I, I found it funny that out of that giant collection of collectible cars, that the only one that I sold was a terrible Ed Bullion quality Lamborghini. So the second one like this was I got this call for this collection at this undisclosed location in Pennsylvania. Wicked cool stuff, really collectible. Low mile Vipers of every variant, all the Ferrari supercars, Lamborghinis with low miles. So we go out there, start looking at these cars, and it's this weird situation because the guy who owns the house in front of it, it's a very humble, small factory town house, but there's just two giant warehouses out back that he built. And he landed somehow this collector from California and they were buying up all these cars and storing them with him. So he had two buildings full, probably, I don't know, a hundred some odd cars, plus all these collectible motorcycles. And he's getting paid handsomely. I mean, this is like, he landed his retirement deal. He got his whale. And he also said that he was getting paid like a bonus. So he's getting paid on every car that sold and they were going to buy him an Aston Martin he also let us know at some point that a couple of the other cars that had sold to another broker, that broker came in and bought him a brand new Corvette in order to like 
grease the wheels. And I was like, oh, this is, this is how you want it to work. You're double dipping and you want me to bribe you. I'm like, yeah, that's not gonna happen. I'm gonna bring offers and you do what you're gonna do with them. The guy who took me there told me, I guess they had gotten an offer for the entire collection because they wanted to sell them not onesie twosie. They wanted to sell them as lots. That was $30 million, we'll say. And they were going to pay this guy a million dollars just for helping. Well, that wasn't enough for him. So they found out when the buyers and the sellers actually sat down at dinner and said their two numbers, realized that the guy who ran the storage facility had put in an extra two million. And so that nixed the deal for everybody. So the deal blew up. So somehow or another, I got the phone number of the guy who actually owned it, allegedly. And I called him. And he's like, well, how'd you get my number? And I just kind of explained who I was and got him to calm down and gave him some offers on the cars. I'm like, well, you the owner. He's like, well, you know, sort of. I handle the cars for this guy or we're partners or whatever. I'm like, this is so convoluted. And in running the VIN numbers of a lot of the cars, like they had never been titled after they bought them from such and such dealers. Some of them were still MSO, but some of them were used and just not in their name. So it was gonna be a disaster of a title situation anyway, because they were just thinking like, oh, we'll just give you the title or sign it off. And I'm like, well, you're not a dealer, so you can't do that. So it quickly went from a hero to a zero situation. I did make them an offer on a package of the Vipers, wasn't enough for them. Made them an offer on the package of Ferrari supercars, wasn't enough for them which I think that deal was gonna fall apart anyway because I was pretty sure the F50 had been fully repainted and my buyers wanted original cars. But I'm like, well, I'll throw in the contingent offer anyway just, just to see if they take it, to see how realistic they are. So literally nothing came of that. And I don't know if they ever sold the cars or if they're still there or what happened to them, but it was a really cool experience to see the collection. For every deal that is not made, there's somebody that closes that guy. But I wasn't the right person to handle those collections at the time. But thankfully, I did kind of land my whale. Recently, I was bestowed with a number of the cars from Chuck Stoddard's estate. Chuck Stoddard is a well-renowned Porsche dealer, race team owner, engineer, just all-around legend within the Porsche world and his widow was selling off the non-Porsches. Because of my reputation, they entrusted me with selling them all, and we ended up selling them all actually no reserve on Bring a Trailer because that's what they wanted. And we had a big preview event, and it was not hard to get the word out about those cars. We did very, very well with those and, and had a lot of fun. We learned a lot because there's some really oddball cars in there, like a BMW 600 sunroof coupe, which is a really rare bird. And we learned some stuff about unique cars and that snowballed from there because we sold a number of other cars. We auctioned off an Abarth 750 Zagato. And because of that sale, somebody else called us with another one and we called the underbidder on this one who happened to be the underbidder on that one when it sold previously at auction and made a deal on that one with one phone call. And we have other people sending cars to us now because of how we represented the collection and some fairly significant collections, some smaller collections, kind of all as a result of that. So thankfully, after enough time in the industry and building up a good reputation, some of the whales are finding us and entrusting themselves to us. So it's it's not all bad. I didn't want to tell this story two years ago because it just would have ended with, I suck at my job. <laughs> you know, Handling large collections is not the focus of what we do, but it's always a lot of fun anyway. It's a nice distraction from the daily work and certainly nice when we can get a lot of 30 or 40 cars to sell from one client. Certainly uh, helps pay the bills and, and pad the retirement fund. Between cannonballs and rallies and car treks, I've been on well over 100 road trips, but one of the things that I always see is that nobody else is terribly prepared. And this is not just a jab at Freddy, but generally people don't bring the tools, the supplies, and the things they need to make it all the way to the destination of their road trip. And so I decided after building kind of the kit that I take between cars for the long drives I go in unreliable vehicles as the ultimate road trip survival kit. And you'll find a link in the description below to an Amazon shopping cart of the things that I think you need in order to get there and get there without a tow bill, 
attached to it. So check it out now, buy what you think you want. Let me know in the comments what I left out and we'll try to keep refining it so we can build the ultimate road trip survival box.